should be having a good I love it. I love it. We're live again. We're doing Roxim Live this week. This is where we talk about Roxim software and how you can design better rockets. My name is Tim Van Milligan and um, Roxim, Roxim Pro, and the Launch Visualizer are all uh, products here at Apogee, and that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, how you can design a better rocket. Um, I've got a monitor over here. That's why I keep looking off to the side. Uh, we have Adam3836 from Connecticut. I don't remember seeing Adam before. And then we have Ben Reedford saying hello. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, what am I doing? I, um, what's going on in my world? I've just been kind of waiting for the Artemis to take off. It's supposed to go off again tomorrow or try another attempt. Um, I was just looking at the, the NASA website here, and they're um, saying that there's a 60% favorable chance. Um, and what they're worried about is scattered rain showers. So 
Let's hope. Uh, tomorrow is Saturday, uh, July 3. Today is July, or July September 3. And um, tomorrow I'm going to be out launching rockets myself down in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, we have a, our local um, launch. It's a big weekend for launches this weekend. Not only Artemis, but I know there's a lot of clubs that are having uh, big launches, you know, in Kansas, um, Airfest, which happens every year. It's one of the biggest regional launches, high power, big rockets. They're doing a big launch down in Alamosa, Colorado. They have a great field down there as well. They had the national sport launch there last year in May. Um, there's Sodfest going on somewhere up north. Um, I know the Denver Club is launching this weekend as well. Just Everybody's launching. This is like, you know, the last hurrah of the summer. So if you're launching tomorrow, uh, let us know. Uh, we'd just like to, uh, you know, support you and, you know, recognize you. Uh, we have <coughs> Art Applewhite <coughs> here. Um, Carlos is saying that my audio is not working well, but I'm seeing my needle going. Is, am, I, am I okay for everybody else? Can everybody else hear me audio-wise? Can you, can you see my lips moving and can you hear my voice? <laughs> Give me a thumbs up if you can, because <clears throat> my microphone looks like it's working, so. Um, I'm going to assume that it's working. So um, let's hope the Artemis, uh, the SLS uh, flies fine tomorrow. Yeah. I should be working. Uh, Adam says he can hear me. Good. <coughs> so maybe, um, maybe Carlos, uh, maybe, did you turn your speakers on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So uh, if you have a question about Roxim, this is where we're going to answer it. Uh, I, that's what we're here about this week. Last week, we did something different. We um, opened up my studio and I did a what was in my range box episode so it was less about Roxim and more about you know launching rockets um, so how'd you like that was it okay or do you like to just you know you you're here for Roxim and you want to learn Roxim so let me know in the comments so I can I can uh, know how that's going um, let's go to my website here I was I was looking at um, I'm getting confused with what the version number we're on we're on 10.4.0 f2 that is the most current version and that was as of uh, May <clears throat> but my programmers have been continuing to work on it and they keep giving me uh, versions to test so um, I have a newer version that they, re they got to me about a week ago. And so that's what I'm going to be playing with. Um, I'm on 10.4.1 F8. Um, the, the, the point one means it's a bug fix version. So 10.4, we fixed all the bugs from 10.3. And we, and we added new features, and that's what raised it up one level. And so then we started back down to zero, assuming there was no bugs. But there was some bugs, so there's going to be a 10.4.1. And then the F number is the, the number that me and my programmer use to go back and forth. Um, because they're, like I said, they're issuing me releases to test. And so I, ha I need to know which release that they sent me so when I report something they could say it was in um, F5 or F6 and so we're already up to F8 on the bug fixes uh, between me and the programmers but yours gonna be when whenever it's released it'll be 10.4.1 um, so if you want to know more about Roxim um, you can go here to the Epigee Rock Rockets .com website um, and then click on how to and guides then come down here to software uh, you can download a free trial you can purchase the software you can see the version history which I was just looking at 
Um, for just starting out, we have video tutorials. Um, and then right now we're doing the Roxim Live training. And I'm going to click on that. And we're on episode number 85 today. And today is September 3. Um, Pat Bank says, last week's podcast was good. That's good to hear. Chris says, I like all of it. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, Carlos says, please consider adding a building tools section to the Apogee shop web pages so we can more easily find the new burrs, blades, and other tools that you have are adding. Okay, Carlos, I'll show you how to get to that tool. Um, and then Mark Sell says, hello from Parker, Colorado. Um, so, Carlos, to get to the tools, come here to Shop, and then come down here to Building Supplies. Okay, on one under the Building Supplies, then scroll down to down here, the bottom right. It says Tools. So this is where our tools are located, but we also have Reload Cleaning Brushes, which could go into Tools, and the, the Fin Alignment Jigs could go into the Tools as well. Somebody's texting me, so I gotta turn that off because it's annoying. There we go. Um, okay, so under tools, you come over here. And so here is the tools, and they're in no particular order. Um, the Epigee sanding tool, eh, sanding T tool. <laughs> Um, that's a great tool to have. It um, allows you to do a lot of different sanding projects, make, make sure things are nice and straight. Um, the newest one is what he was talking about in the comments was the sanding burr set. Um, when we first released it, we just released these five different sanding burrs, um, but we have since added a pin vise to hold everything, and the pin vise makes it makes all the difference. It's it makes holding things really easy. Um, and and these sanding burrs. Um, let me see if I can. You can see that I was concentrating. I I specified these and had these specifically made for rocketeers like myself. So I built these for me, and I know if they work well for me, they're going to work well for you. Um, but I was looking for special tools. Because um, sometimes, you know, when you, you put, put the uh, sandpaper on the tip of your finger and you're trying to sand and you, your finger's just too big. And then, you know, you wrap sandpaper around, it's just, you just can't get into those tight corners. So I got these sanding burrs. Uh, the technical word is burrs, but um, I call them tip sanders. Because um, I, got, I got this nice round one here with, you know, really flat tip. And I got another one with a flat tip, but then also, you know, a longer side. So this is good for like the inside of uh, body tubes. Um, then we got different shapes. You know, sometimes you got to be careful with an edge. You can actually put too much pressure on it. So I got a couple of them with rounded edges on them. Um, and they, lo they look like they're, they're really gritty, but actually this is really fine. So this is like the fine sanding at the very end when you want to make everything like smooth enough to paint. Um, these are, I asked them for, you know, these are diamond coated, little tiny particles of diamond. And then they, uh, I don't know how they electroplate them onto the, to the metal, but somehow they do. Um, so they're permanently attached. And if they get clogged, one of the cool things that I discovered is you just kind of soak them in um, acetone. And the acetone will dissolve any paint or um, sanding seal or anything. And then it just, it just dissolves away and you clean them right up. Um, so, uh, yeah, I find um, what they're really good for is um, inside, like this is a 3D printed item. And on a 3D printed item, there's always supports, you know, and they have they leave the little nubs. And so I use these to get down in there. You could never get your finger into the corner. Um, so they're really good for that. Um, for sanding, you know, curvature on a fillet on the bottom of a rocket. 
again, that's a really hard to reach place. Um, so that's kind of what they look like. Ben Reedford says the audio is buggy. I wonder if it's my phone because it's like I got lots super super amount of chats going off here on my phone. Uh, huh? I think something isn't plugged in all the way. Says Ben. Okay, I'm gonna unplug and then I'll plug it back in. Alfred Indy says. Uh, I will have to was th watch this later, but I enjoy these videos anyway. Thankful for the information. So thank you, Alfred. Plugged back in. <laughs> so hopefully that fixed whatever was going on. All right, so let's get into Roxim. Um, so that was tools on the Apogee website. So um, I've got a... Um, question this week that came in. I got one more. Carlos says a jig section for excellent fin alignment and other jigs would be handy. Uh, well, they're into the tool section, Carlos. <laughs> um, I had a question this week from uh, somebody that was, um, I guess has been in rocketry a long time because what they said was um, I'm designing a two-stage rocket and you know, if you go through the old Estes plans from years and years ago, the fins on the booster stage were a lot bigger than the ones on the upper stage. And so what's the rule of thumb? You know, how, how much surface area should I put on the booster stage? And so I told him, uh, it's not so much the surface area, it's the center of pressure location. And then he came back and he says, well, well, how do you change the center of pressure location? How big should I make my fins? <laughs> he kept getting back to the size of the fins. And this went on for like three, almost four days. He kept asking the same question, just rephrasing in different ways. And so um, what I'll start out with is, you know, how does Roxim handle a two-stage rocket and how should you size your fins for a two-stage rocket? So here is a rocket called the Razzle Dazzle, which I have here holding in my hands. Uh, and this is a two-stage rocket. And you can see, if you look at it just right, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but the fins are the same size on the booster and the sustainer. So, and it's a stable rocket. Um, so let me, let me show you what it looks like here in Roxim. So here's our two-stage rocket. And if I just, just show the upper stage, you can see. And then if I add the lower stage, just click in this button right here. It adds back. Oops, what happened? I changed it to three stages instead of two. Um, it looks like one fin, but it's actually two sets of fins because there's a booster stage. This black part down here is the booster stage. Uh, the most important part when designing a rocket is stability. Stability, you can equate stability to predictability. Because we want to be able to predict that the rocket's going to go straight. Because we don't want it to go all crooked. Um, so we always look at stability. And you'll see that in the side view or the top view of the rocket. And it's right here is the stability part. Um, and what's important is the center of gravity and the center of pressure location. Um, for a rocket to be stable, the center of gravity, which is this symbol right here, has to be in front of, which means towards the nose of the center of pressure of the rocket. Um, and that has, the fins are important, but and the size of the fins is important, but as long as this is in front of there, it doesn't matter what size the fins are. In fact, you can make a rocket, a two-stage rocket, where you don't have fins on the bottom stage at all, and it will fly perfectly fine. As long as the center of gravity, when you launch it, is in front of the center pressure. So let's um, open up a design and... Um, turn it into a two-stage rocket. So I'm just looking at something here, something. Uh, 
Uh, let's try a blue streak. Uh, allow streak. I am looking for a blue streak .rkt file. Let me sort here by Roxim Design. <laughs> Apogee Blue Streak. Okay, there it is. Open. Save that one now. Okay, so here we have a blue streak. And the first thing is the most important thing when doing stability is making sure that the rocket motor is installed. Why is that important? because it's going to change the location of the center of gravity. The center of gravity is where the rocket balances. And if we put a heavy motor in the back end, it's going to weight it down. And so we need to have that center of gravity as far back on the rocket as what's practical. Um, for And this is the worst case situation. And, and anything with a lighter that's lighter is going to be good. If it, if it will fly stable with the rocket motor in, it will fly stable with the rocket motor out, assuming your rocket motor is in the back. Um, okay, so what I need to do is to add a motor in here. So I'll go to prepare for launch. And I'm going to come down here to choose engine. And it doesn't matter which one I choose. Well, actually, you want to choose the biggest engine that you think you're going to fly with. Um, so here's an S to C6, so I'll use that one, and I'll make it a C6-7, and I'll click OK. So why the biggest engine that you might fly with? Because the biggest engine has more propellant, which makes it more heavy, which means the center of gravity is further to the back. That's why we want the biggest engine in there that we plan on using for the rocket. So I've got it loaded. You can see it's loaded here. When I come back to here, you can see this brown rectangle. That's the rocket motor. Where the center of gravity used to be over, like right here. Now it's moved right here. And our center of gravity is still in front of the center of pressure, which is good. Um, and this margin here, this number, tells us how far in front of the center of pressure it is. And it means 1.68 times the diameter of the rocket. So here's the diameter. So if you take that distance here, the diameter, not the circumference, the diameter, um, and you multiply it by 1.68, and that's this distance from that point to that point. Um, and we like to see that margin at least 1.0. It doesn't have to be, but greater than one is good. Um, you, you know, and it can get a lot further. It can get two, three, four. That's fine. I want to see, it, like, you know, rule of th if there's a rule of thumb, this is one of them. Make that margin at least 1.0 because um, that center pressure can change a little bit depending on the angle of attack that the rocket's flying at. And we don't want it to shift forward to where that it just moves in front of the center of gravity. Because if it moves in front, we're going to have an unstable rocket. And we can, we can show you that here in a, in a second. And Art Applewhite, Art Applewhite's reading my mind. He says, Chad, or Chad staging, cheap and dirty, two-stage. Is that what you're describing? A booster motor with no fins um, and the motor is taped to the sustainer? And that's exactly right. Um, a good example of this you could do that a lot of people do is the Estes Big Bertha, where you can just tape a motor onto the bottom of it. Those fins on the Big Bertha are so big and, and the rocket is so stable that you know just an extra motor on the back end, um, it will still fly fine. So, okay. Uh, Alfred Indy's uh, Mark Spell. I was wondering if Roxim can be made to identify mass objects without having to select the owning part and then scroll through the component list. Uh, okay. <laughs> Mark, I'm going to come back to that question as that's a really good question. Um, 
Johan de Sloper says, yeah, 50 millimeters of C2H50, H5OH. I'm not sure what that is. Is that sugar? <laughs> or is that beer? I don't know. Uh, and he also writes, I'm clumsy too. Always reading glasses now, better for sanding. Yeah, okay. All right, so getting back to our two-stage rocket. Let's add a second stage to this. And that's really easy to do. You come here to the Design Attributes tab. You click on that. And then you come down here to Number of Stages. And we're just going to select Two Stage. And as soon as we do that, and we come back here the to the Design Components tab, you'll see there's another component down here, and it's called the Booster Stage. Right now, there's no components attached to the Booster Stage. There's only components attached to the sustainer stage. So we need to add some parts down here. <clears throat> so I'm going to, to add a part, you highlight it and say, okay, I'm going to attach it to here. And then you can come over here and say, what are you attaching? And we're going to say, okay, we're going to attach another body tube. And then it goes into the database and it's saying, okay, what tube do you want? And I want an 18 millimeter tube. So here's an 18 millimeter. And how did I know it's 18 millimeter? Well, because um, I know based on my history that the blue streak is an 18 millimeter tube. And that's this diameter right here. Um, so I'm going to select an 18 millimeter tube. And when I do, you can see it added a tube right here. But I don't need it that long. So now I'm just going to shorten it up. So I am making it shorter. You can see the length here is getting shorter as I move this slider bar. Really easy to do. You can make it as short as you want, or as long as you want. Typically, um, or, or I could say often, they are 2.75 inches long, which is the length of a rocket motor. Uh, so that's how that comes about. So here's the tube. It's this purple color. Let me change the color so you can see a little bit better. Let's make it a red color. Okay, so here's the tube. And under the general tab, I also want to set this as this is a motor mount. And, and at this point, you see all this stuff jumped in here. So I can load an engine at this point in time, or I can ignore it and load it later. But I like to load the motors as fast as I can into the design because, as we said, we want to design with the worst case. And the worst case is with a heavy back end with fresh rocket motors in it. So I'm going to load another C6 motor into this because that's kind of the heaviest motor that I plan on flying. And this one will be a C60 because this is a booster stage. So I'm going to click OK and it put it right back here. So now notice that the center of gravity is now behind the center of pressure. Because of that extra weight back here, um, it moved back. So at this point, we are unstable. And you'll see that right here. It says unstable. And it tells me the margin is 0.92. So it's almost a full body tube diameter behind. So now we need to add fins to this rocket to make it um, stable again. So this is where the, the question came in from um, that customer that was calling us on the phone. Um, how big do I make that? You know, should it be 2x? Should it be 1x? Um, so here is, here is what it's, it's going to be so fast you're, you're going to be blown away. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add fins to this body tube. So I'm just going to select the body tube and I add a fin. Now I've got a choice of different fins. I have regular trapezoid fins, which are these right here. It's trapezoid or ellipse. Then we have custom fins. A custom fin is anything that has a curve on the edge. Um, and then we have a ring tail, which is a ring around the outside of the fins. And then tube fins, which are small tubes attached to the body tube. Um, I'm just going to use regular um, trapezoid fins here. And the first thing it does is it um, looks in the database. Do you want to select the fin from the database? I'm going to say no. I'm going to click Cancel. 
And you can see that Roxem has added a fin back here. Now the question, his question is, how did you how did you figure out that area? How did how did Roxim is Roxim trying to calculate it for me? And the answer is no. This fin right here is right at this point in time is purely cosmetic. We designed Roxim to say, let add a fin that makes the rocket look like a rocket. It doesn't have anything to do with stability at this point. The stability Designing the stability happens not in Roxim, it happens up here between your ears. You have to move that center of gravity in front of the center of pressure. It, it is purely coincidental that Roxim added a fin that was big enough to move that center of pressure further back, so now it's stable again. It's just purely coincidental. That's what it is at this point. Now we're going to use human logic to redesign if necessary. It may not be necessary, but we can't. Um, so let's say, let's make these fins as small as possible. Okay, we could try that. All right, so here's, here's a fin, and we're just gonna make it small. As long as that center of gravity is in front of the center pressure, it's gonna be stable. So uh, first thing I might do is I might move the location of that fin and slide it forward. So I'm going to slide it forward to the front of the tube, which I know is like right here. This is the dividing line between the two tubes. Um, this line right here is the back end of the rocket motor in the front. Um, so I know that the tube is right there. Um, and Roxam right now doesn't want to let me go even further than that, but you actually can. You just come here and you type in a negative number. So you put a negative sign, um, and then you can put like um, 0.5 inches. And I'm going to hit the tab key, and it shifted it a half of an inch forward of the front of the tube. And if I look at my center of gravity right here, let me zoom in. Technically, this is still stable uh, because the center of gravity is in front of the center of pressure right there. And if we come out here, we can see it's marginally stable. <clears throat> um, so not only is fin size important, what I'm showing here is fin placement on the rocket is also important. So just by moving your fins around, you can change the center of pressure location. And let's, let's move them back a little bit here. We'll move them back. You can see my rocket is getting more and more stable. Um, so if I put them all the way at the back of the tube, this is the back of the tube right here, <clears throat> I can see you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a margin of 1.21. So that's actually pretty good. Um, but let's see if we can make them smaller. So I'm going to choose the semi-span. The semi-span is measured from the root edge where it attaches to the tube to the tip. So it's this vertical distance right here. And I'll, I'll move it until I get a margin of 1.0. So I'm just going to grab it and make it smaller, getting closer. Oh, I'm moving location. <laughs> Uh, make it to the base of the owning part. Grabbing the wrong slider. Okay, I want to get semi-span. I made it too small. I'm looking at this number down here. And, uh, you know, it's so um, tweaky. Um, I'm going to use my, my uh, the arrows on my keypad to adjust this slider bar right here. So if you put your cursor on the slider and then you use the arrow keys on your keypad, um, I can bump it up. So I'm like really close right now to 0.98 margin. So that means the distance here is almost exactly one body tube diameter. And that was it. Um, so now we can fly the rocket and we can see what it looks like. So let's, um, I'm going to save this as 
I'm going to save it to my desktop. Blue Streak 2 stage. Let's hit save. Um, and now we've got the engines already loaded, but we, let's see what our other flight parameters are. Um, so under flight events, I got a streamer in the sustainer, and that's going to deploy at maximum ejection. Um, starting state, I got a 36 inch launch rod, and I'm angled seven point, let's make it a, an exact seven degrees. And then the launch conditions, I got an eight mile an hour wind and an altitude of 700 feet above sea level. So that's okay. And then let's go see the flight profile and see what it looks like. So, you know, I can kind of cheat as it was, as it was running the simulation, I saw that number pop up. 2488, and that's our maximum altitude on that flight. So this rocket's going to go really high. That's almost a half a mile. Um, so here's the rocket sitting down here. And when we launch it, rockets takes off. Um, that first stage is already dropped off. It's right here. It's inside the smoke. And it's falling down right there next to my cursor. And then the upper stage, is, it's falling down there. So the, the booster stage is the red dots, and it, it's already landed, and the sustainer is coming down on its parachute, and it's going to be in the air a long time yet. We're at 25, 6, 26 seconds, and so we got a long way to go. So I'm going to speed it up, and we can see um, it lands about 814 feet downrange. All right, so that's the rocket. Um, what's cool is you can um, now take this and throw it into the launch visualizer on the internet. Um, we've already saved it. Let me see what it looks like in 3D. Okay, so we got a white booster and a blue upper stage. Okay, so to go to the launch visualizer, you open up a browser window and you go to rocksim.com. And it's loading right now. And all this is done in the cloud. And I'm going to log in. I have an account. You can make a free account right up here. Um, so if you, if you don't have an account, you can just create a new account, or you can log in using Google, or you can log in using Apogee. Whatever you create an account with, it, with um, you, from there on out, you have to log in that method. So when I created my account, I created a new account. So I have to put in my information in here. So that's what I'll do. I'll sign in. And it's going to uh, reload the rocket. And I'm going to upload that new rocket that I just created. And so I'm going to say upload a new rocket, hit browse. Um, I put it on the desktop. And it was an Apogee Blue Streak 2 stage. Hit open. And then upload. And we'll see what it looks like. It was successfully uploaded. So there's the rocket sitting on the launch pad. Just kind of as we remembered it, you know, blue upper stage, white bottom stage. Um, now we have to pick a launch site. So who are we going to pick on this week? Um, Parker, Colorado. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm not sure what, what, is that Crash? Crash. Here's the NARC website called Crash. And I'm not sure if this is their current launch site or not. Okay, so here's the launch, so this is a compass down here, so when, when the black is facing upwards, that would be north. Okay, so oh, this is their old, old, old launch site because they were they don't they don't launch here anymore. Bear Creek Lake Park. I've launched several times here. There's a there's a reservoir with this big dam right here. Um, I'm not sure where they're launching from now, but we'll launch here just for grins. So there's a parking lot. Um, we have to set our launch angle, and I think we were at, what do we say, 7 degrees from vertical? 7 degrees from vertical, and we'll launch that to the west. Under our weather conditions, 
Let me see what the wind is like. I got a four, I was making an eight mile an hour wind. Hit tab, click OK. So the, the wind is coming out of the, the west. So you can see the arrow from the west blowing towards the east at eight miles an hour. Click OK. Let's go load some rocket motors. So what you can see what I'm doing is I'm just going down the list of, of buttons right here. Um, under rocket motors, we're going to choose engines. And, well, wait a minute here. I know this is a two-stage rocket. How come my up bottom stage didn't show up? Oh, man. Um, C67. Okay. I should be seeing a bottom stage right here. Huh. Don't know why it didn't show up. Um, I've got uh, this is staging. That will happen maximum. See here it looks like it sees there's a, an event. But when I come over here, I should see another motor. And it shows a streamer. So I wonder what would happen if I launched right now. So it's kind of hidden behind my head. But here's the launch button down here. So I click on that. And it tells me how many credits I'm going to use. And I'm going to simulate. And it's running. Yeah, so now the, bo the booster stage went away. <laughs> I launch it. And it's going high. We're you know well over a thousand feet already. And here's the rocket in the sky. Um, I want to kind of see its um, trajectory path and the extruded ground path. Um, so that what I did was I added these lines right here. So um, these extruded gives me kind of like a curtain of you know, where the rocket is with respect to the ground. So I'm kind of trying to zoom in on the ground here. Let me pause it. I'm going to go to a trajectory view so it doesn't jump around so much for us. And you can see this was the launch point. It went out this way, and now it's coming back this direction. And I'm going to just bring it all the way back down to the ground. And it didn't land too far away, which was pretty nice. Still in the parking lot. But it would have been nice to see a two-stage rocket there. <laughs> uh, let's see if we will lo load a different two-stage rocket. We'll do a two-stage. So I'm going to select the rocket design, go to choose design. Uh, here's a Comanche 3. That's a three-stage rocket. Um, we'll use this, all the same settings except for the rocket motors. So let's choose an engine here, um, C6, OK. And good. Um, so that loaded it into the upper stage, the sustainer. This is the middle stage right here. And this is the bottom stage. So the middle stage uses an 18, and the bottom uses a 24. So I can load this engine really fast by clicking the Load All button. And it will load that same motor into all engine mounts in the rocket that have the same diameter, which is why it loaded it into this one, but not into that one. So um, so my sustainer, I want a seven second delay. This booster, I want a zero second delay. Um, so we can launch it like this. We don't need to put a motor in the bottom. And then we'll just turn it into a two-stage rocket. And we'll just click Launch, Simulate, and see what happens. We got a, another question over here. When designing supersonic rockets, should the fins stick out past the shockwave cone starting at the nose quick tip? Does Roxim care? Um, that's a good question, Carlos. <laughs> um, Okay, let's launch this one first, and then we'll get to. We had we had another question before from um, Mark Cell. So here's the rocket. We're launching it. Just two stages. You can see the the enlarged view right here. So what did I do? Did I put a C67 in the booster? <laughs> I must have. Ah. 
Let me check that out. What did I do wrong? What the heck happened here? Let's look back here. C6, 0, and a C6, 7. Now try it again. That should have staged right at, uh, oh, well, I didn't check my flight events. Shoot. Let's try that again. Check the flight events. Now we're looking for staging. Okay, it says maximum ejection delay. That one says maximum ejection delay. And that should have been right. So let's see if it works this time. I don't think it is. It looks like the same amount of time as before. It should have staged right there. Get to talk to the programmers again, say, what's going on? And let's try with a different rocket. Let's try with a real two-stage instead of a three-stage. Choose a design. Under the demo designs, I got an Apogee Sky Metra. Select. So this is a two-stage rocket. Again, we're going to leave everything the same, just the rocket motors, choose an engine. Okay, here's our C6. C6, 7, click OK. So that loaded it in the top, and load all, and it will load it in the bottom. And come over here to ejection delay and make the bottom one a 0 instead of a 7. So that was a fast way of loading rocket engines in. And let's launch, let's see what happens. Come on, let's work this time. Okay, I kind of think it's going to work because this is a pretty long flight time here of 120 seconds. And let's see. Um, weather cocking cone. Well, what I wanted the weather cocking cone is because is I know that the rocket is going to, it tells me the approximate height of the rocket by telling me the height of this cone. So that's kind of what I want to see. I want to make sure that my rocket's going to stay in that cone. And we already know it's going to drift from the east to the west. Okay, so the rocket is right there, which on the pad it looks like that. It takes off. You can see it's rising. Okay, so the booster just fell off. The upper stage is now coasting. And right about there's the apogee point, and the streamer is out, and now the rocket is coming down. And we're at 1,600. I think we were close to 1,700 feet for our maximum altitude there. And now this rocket's going to come down to the ground. Um, I'm going to stretch it out and see where it lands. Oh, this one landed on the dam. So this right here is the dam, and it's a pretty wide dam. But you can see it does have a little bit of height to it. So it's, it's about halfway up the dam at this point right here, so that's pretty good. <laughs> okay, let's go back to these questions here because that's what we're here for. Okay, so... Um, let's go to Mark Sell's question. He says, I wonder if Roxim could be made to identify mass objects without having to select the owning part and then scroll through the components list. So what he's talking about is, okay, so you hear under the design components, um, there's things like a mass object. And um, in the 2D drawing, if you look at it from a 2D, um, we have well, I only have one mass object in here, but a lot of rockets will have multiple mass objects. And his question was, how do you select it? How do you know which one you're selecting down here? And the answer, Mark, is um, currently in the version that you have, you can't tell. Um, in the version that I have, you can't tell. But the version that my programmer is working on today that's, that's the new feature that we want to add is when you click on this mass object, it will highlight it down here. And it goes the other way too. You know, you can click on a part in the 2D drawing. I should be able to click on a part 
and it should highlight it up here. See, I clicked on the launch lug and it highlighted the launch lug up here. It should allow me to click on a tube. There's a fin, there's a fin. Why is it not letting me click on that tube? There's the streamer. See, I can click on everything but the tube. I can even click that launch log right there, or the uh, engine block. So, Mark, um, that feature is coming where we're going to show which item that you're, you know, mass object down here. Um, we know that that's an issue. The fact that you brought it up tells me that it's an issue. Um, so we're working on that one right now as we speak. Okay, so Carla says, uh, when designing supersonic rockets, should the fins stick out past the shock wave coming off the nose cone? And does Roxim predict this? Um, and the answer is Roxim does not predict it. So um, that is a good question. So what he's saying is when you go supersonic, you, you get a shock wave that, that forms on any sharp object. And it will form, and then it will come back and make a cone. And will, do you need to put your fins on the outside of the cone? Um, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't think it will hurt. Um, but I don't know if you absolutely necessarily have to do it. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. It's been a long time. Um, yeah. So that's a good question. I don't know. Um, but Carlos asks, can you name the mass objects to tell them apart? And the answer there is yes. Um, so like this mass object right here, I, I actually gave it this name. That's a name um, that I gave. If you just add a new mass object, you just click on mass object, um, the name, the generic name is just mass. So it says mass right here. That's the name that Roxim gave it. And if I add it, um, well, it's got to be greater than zero. Let's make it six grams. Click OK. Um, and if I come here to the parts tree, it just says mass. If you want to rename it, which is a really good idea, double click on it. And you can say, you know, just type in a new name, nose cone mass. So yeah, so that is, I always tell people, give everything a different name. You know, if this has two launch lugs on it, I got this one right here and I got another one right here, um, you know, name them. You know, this one's aft launch lug, this one's the forward launch lug, so you can tell them apart. Most people don't do that, though. And then they have to come back later and try to figure it out. Um, now with, with inversion 10.4, you can actually click on a part, and it will highlight it up here. Well, that actually came out in version 10.0. That was one of the new features. Um, so you can do that. But the, the problem is with the mass objects, um, because it doesn't have a size, it's just a point. And so trying to click on the exact point doesn't really work. Um, so what our programmers are working on is a way to make that clickable. So you can just click on it and find it. So when you click here, it finds it right here. Or if you click up here, it will find it down here. Mark Sell says, I have been color coding mass objects by component. Blue for hardware, yellow for glue and paint, and red for electronics. That's also a good idea. So if you wanted to um, change the color of your mass, so here's the nose cone mass, and it's this blue one right here. Again, like you are going to change the name, you can also change the color, which is right up here. And so... Now he says, you know, red for electronics. So I come over here to red and I say, this is some kind of altimeter inside the nose cone. And, oops, that's the wrong color. I need the 2D color right there. And it changes that color as well. So that's a really good tri tip there, Mark. Um, Tom says, be sure to consider flutter at those speeds, at supersonic speeds. And Tom is also right. You know, when you get 
Um, this shape fin right here is probably not good for supersonic speeds because it's going to have a lot of flutter. Does Roxim predict flutter? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, and the reason is that um, it has to do with the strength. You know, can you predict the strength of a part? And strength is, is determined by two things. One is the material. So if it was made out of steel or aluminum that has a homogeneous uh, strength in any direction, yeah, that would work. Um, or, you know, if it's balsa wood, it only has strength in one direction. You know, it's strength along the, the span like this. Um, but the other component that determines how strong a part is, is how it's attached to the rest of the rocket. You know, is it, is it just a surface mount butt joint? You know, you're just, if this is the tube and the fin comes in from the side, um, is, you know, how strong is that joint there where it attaches? And what is that joint made out of? Is it, is it glue? Is it through the wall fin? what kind of glue, um, how much glue. And so there's a lot of variables right there that determine the strength of the actual strength of the fin. And Roxim has no idea what you're doing and how you're designing rockets. It can't make an assumption on your building skills. And it really does come down to building skills. So, you know, somebody that with, with, that's been doing rocketry a long while and they know how to put on a fin that's really strong, it's different from somebody that's a newbie. Um, you know, they just don't know how much fin fillet to put on. Um, a lot of it becomes, you know, trial and error and experience. You know, experienced rocketeers, they know a lot of stuff um, and they, and they, and for them, it's second nature. You know, when I build a rocket, I'll put the fin on and I'll put, the, I'll put a fillet on. I don't even think about it um, but because I've been doing it for so long. So when you're out on the launch range and you see an expert out there, and you can tell who's the expert because their rockets look really nice. If you see a really nice looking rocket, this is not the first rodeo for this guy or gal. They've been building rockets before. So go up and ask them, you know, hey, you know, how big do you make your fillets? How do you attach your fins? How do you make sure it's really strong? That's the kind of stuff that you need to know. Um, and it comes from experience. And it doesn't have to be your experience. It can be somebody else's experience. You know, a mentor, you know, the definition of a mentor is experience for you <laughs> without the, the pain and suffering that they went through. Uh, because trust me, they, you know, somebody that got that good has broke a lot of rockets and you know, they learn from experience how to make them. And if you're that way, be sure to ex you know, explain to those newbies coming up through the ranks. You know, um, I've been doing rockets for you know, 40 something years. Um, and a lot of the new people that are coming into the hobby now, you know, when I started in the hobby, we didn't have video games and computers that distracted us from learning building skills. So I learned a lot of building skills right out of the gate. Newbies that are coming into the hobby, you know, their, their attention is diverted to video games and Nerf guns and whatever, you know. Yeah social media, whatever. And so they don't have a lot of construction experience. And so it's up to us as experts to convey that to them so that, to, you know, to raise them up as quickly as they can because they're dangerous. <laughs> and we want to get them up to competent um, because as quickly as they can to get them off of dangerous into competent and then up to expert. Um, yeah, because, you know, what they do affects us, too. You know, it, it only takes one person to hurt somebody. You know, that could have repercussions for the entire hobby. So it's up to us to 
convey our knowledge and experience to newbies. Um, we, I want them to be successful. I want them to be, <laughs> Ron says, whippersnappers. <laughs> ah, Vernon says, I'm having a simulation issue in the launch visualizer with the Sky Torpedo and a D-22-4 where the animation does not load. It only happens with that motor. I tried it on other computers and same. Uh, okay. The Sky Torpedo in the launch visualizer. Let's go to the back to the launch visualizer. I closed it, so I got to open it up again. Um, let's see. Have I already uploaded it? Sky Torpedo. No, I do not have a Sky Torpedo, so I need to upload one. Um, so I'm going to go to the Apogee website. Sky Torpedo. There's what the Sky Torpedo looks like. And if you come down here to Roxim file and just click on that, it jumps you down to the bottom of the page and you can download it for free. And it just downloaded it on my computer. I don't know if you saw it. And then from, I, from there, I'll go back into the launch visualizer and upload it. So upload new design. Browse, and that was in my downloads folder. <sighs> Dynastar Sky Torpedo. Um, I am going to upload that, and it's got some decals with it. That's what it's showing here. So I'll open that, and I'm going to add the textures. So textures are the decals. So as soon as you click on Add Textures, you'll get this right here, and this is where you'll start to add them. And I'm going to select all of these decals. And they can only be PNGs or JPEGs, so that's how you tell them apart. And so it added those, and then click here, Upload. And it will upload it. And it says it was successful. OK, so you can see, you can see the decals, and I got some decals that are not quite applied correctly. But the nose cone and the body tube, I think the body tube is backwards. I think the sky torpedo goes up in front. But that's OK. I can't change that here. I can only change that in Roxham. Um, let's load a motor. Um, launch site. Um, I'll choose a different launch site. Astronomical Society of Toronto. I'm just seeing where this is. It's in somebody's backyard. <laughs> Here's a pool. Um, let's find the closest field to his house. Right there. There's a looks like there's a, a football field or a track some kind of school will launch right from their, their property. So I'm going to confirm that launch site. Um, starting state. Uh, we'll go straight up. Let's load the motor. And he says a D22W. Choose an engine. So I'm going to search for the engine D22. There it is. It's a 24 millimeter. He says a four second delay. Click OK. OK, so that motor is loaded. And let's see what the flight events are. Maximum ejection delay. And then we'll launch. Simulate. And let's see what it says. It says, does not load. Huh, you're right. It's not loading. <laughs> um, let's try a different motor. Choose engine. E15, we'll go with the seven second. And launch, simulate. Okay, so it's loading this time. So there it is sitting on the pad in the middle of the field. 
and then launch it. Okay, so you're right, Vernon. It's not loading with a D24W-4, which tells me it's the motor, because if, if other motors are loading fine, it must be that D24. Um, I bet you this one lands outside of the uh, of the park. Yeah, it's definitely because we're almost to the uh, perimeter already, and it's still way up in the air, way up there. So uh, it's gonna maybe come down over here. Let's see. Oh man, way out there. Yeah, this kind of looks like a shopping mall. <laughs> yeah, it landed way far away. Um, what we can do to check that, Vernon, this is what I do. This is called troubleshooting. This is how I troubleshoot. Let's open up a different rocket design that has a 24 millimeter engine mount and try to load that same motor in it. And let's see if, uh, oops, I didn't want to upload. I want to select the rocket, choose the design. Um, here's a grappler. I know that's a 24 millimeter. Select. Choose an engine. Again, we'll D22. D22. Let's try a seven second delay. Click OK. And launch it. Simulate. Okay, so it's the same issue. It's it's not the four, it's the the whole D22 file. That's the issue. So it looks like we got to fix that one. That's one of our bugs. Um, yeah, I have to write that one down. <laughs> Fat Bank says taken to the streets. <laughs> He's talking about where it landed. That's great. All right, so. That's all the questions that we had. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. I appreciate it. Um, this has been great. You guys have been so awesome. Um, yeah, so what did we talk about today? We talked about the D22. We talked about the SLS. We talked about adding a booster stage onto a rocket. Um, and then we discovered some bugs that we need to fix. <laughs> which happens every time that we come on here. Every, every week is an embarrassment. <laughs> uh, this is the Razzle Dazzle rocket kit. Um, it's, I have a poster with the Razzle Dazzle, but uh, not on the wall today. I have to, have to remember that one next time. Um, we will be back next week. Um, if today is the second, that means it will be September 9. Um, and hopefully we'll have seen the Artemis take off. And hopefully my flights go good. I'm going to do some really cool stuff tomorrow when I'm on the rocket range. Um, I'm testing um, a gliding parachute. Um, we talked about it in this week's newsletter. So if you go to the Apogee homepage and you scroll down here to read it in here, and scrolling down in my article, we talked about how to make carbon fiber nose cones. And then we also did, you know, what's going on at Apogee. And one of the things is that um, here's the gliding parachute. Um, and so that's what it looks like. Although um, the colors are now different. Um, we actually had it printed with a design on it, kind of like the other Apogee nylon parachutes. Um, one of the things that I discovered is you need to know which direction you're going. So all the parachutes kind of have an idea, like either an arrow or um, triangles that point forward. So you can tell which way the, the parachute is flying. Um, because it's remote control, you, you take your RC it only, it only needs one channel, but you can't even find a one-channel receiver anymore. Um, I, I had to buy one, and it's got six channels, um, but you only use one. You can only go left or right. Um, and so you'll turn it left or right, 
And then, so once you're turning and you're looking up in the sky, you gotta know which direction that parachute is going. So you can turn left or right. Um, and hopefully you can bring it down right at your feet. When we started um, this project, oh, you're not seeing it, uh, my desktop. So that, that's what it looks like. Um, so when you're flying it, when we first started the project, it was gonna be GPS controlled. And we actually got it working with GPS. The only problem is COVID happened, and then there was that nightmare with all the electronics industry. You can't get um, parts. And so we couldn't get parts to build the GPS component of it. And so we just kind of stepped it backwards and say, if you have RC airplane equipment, and you might be able to get it. I was able to get it. Um, you just put your RC airplane equipment in there and then you can just fly it down just like you would an airplane. And the nice thing about it is it's a lot more forgiving than an airplane. Uh, because of an airplane you can crash it. <laughs> and this is once the parachute is open um, and if it if it's got to be trimmed but once it's trimmed it will always fly straight. And so even if you are bad at controlling it will still go straight you know you can turn and it's it's very gentle so this might be a way of learning hand-eye coordination of controlling something way up in the sky um, and and even if you screw up it's still going to come down slow <laughs> so you're although it's got it's got to be trimmed right that's the the caveat is it's got to be trimmed right because it, it, like a, any glider if you don't trim it um, you could end up um, putting it into a, 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 a death spiral. And it's gonna come down faster. It'll, it'll still probably come down slow enough where you're not gonna break too much. But it's still, when you're in a spiral like that, things are whipping around. Um, and that's the whipping around part is the part where things get destroyed because you know the glider might come down vertical nice and slow, but on the end of the string, the rocket is going 100 miles an hour. <laughs> and that, that could break things. Um, so yeah, you gotta trim it. And unfortunately, the only way to trim it is to fly it. So that's what I'm gonna be doing tomorrow is crossing my fingers that I can trim this thing so that it flies straight, because then once it's flying straight, then you can turn on the RC and um, go left and right and try to gut, glide it back down to your feet because who likes to chase rockets? <laughs> Nobody. So that's it for today. Um, have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. So I'm going to end this in five, four, three, two, one. Go out and launch something.